Hi, welcome to another edition of North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and my guest today is Tom Root. And Tom is the CEO of a local company called Acera, Acera LLC. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Tom? Yes, correct. Acera, okay. And uh, this is a local company. You're located in the Cummings Center, correct? Yes, we are. Correct. And Tom's company uh, makes specialized LED lighting solutions for uh, a number of different industries and applications, uh, including uh, medical, the field, robotic, dental, veterinary. Uh, but I won't steal his thunder here. So, Tom, can you can you briefly tell us? Uh, and and I might add to our audience. We're going to talk about that, and and after we talk about the lighting products, we're going to talk about a, a new product that Tom's company has introduced, which <clears throat> is intended to help prevent the spread of the coronavirus, and we'll talk about that as well. well tell us a little bit about your, your lighting products, Tom. What makes them special? What makes them stand out? Thank you, Walt. Um, when we launched this company back in 2015, the primary objective was to increase patient access and speed of delivery by minimizing the need for tabletop or large bulky xenon lighting. And so we developed uh, a special lens system, patented lens system that allows us to bring LED lighting in a portable format to endoscopic procedures. Uh, it was initially targeted, at, targeted to office-based procedures, such as ear, nose, and throat, uh, gynecological and urological procedures. But it has expanded outward into the hospitals, into the emergency rooms, and the like. Also, most medical device companies have an industrial segment, whether it's an x-ray company or an ultrasound company. The same things that are done in medicine are done in industry to test the quality of high uh, technology parts and components. In particular, the aviation industry uses endoscopy uh, extensively to look at the health of the engine internals and in internals of the aircraft itself. So those are just a couple of examples right there. And as I understand, you've been very successful in the endoscopy realm um, uh, because of the fact that your, your, your product, your lighting is untethered? How, how does that work? Why is that a benefit? Right. So um, in a traditional endoscopic procedure, the light source itself is a benchtop light source that is tethered via the use of a fiber optic light guide. Right. That light guide causes many problems in that one, it breaks down over time. Two, it needs to be sterilized. And three, it actually reduces the total amount of light that's delivered to the endoscope itself. So, um, and, and in fact, it restrains the doctor from being able to move freely about the patient. So with ours, it is completely portable and it can either be embedded into the scope itself or it can be clipped onto the scope as a somewhat of a handpiece. And so uh, we find that particularly in the ear, nose, and throat, ENT world, um, this is very exciting. Now, you, you manufacture uh, finished devices, and you also provide OEM solutions to people that have uh, certain needs, and then you adapt your, your lighting to there. Uh, give us an idea of some of the companies that you've worked with and what those applications have been. Yeah, certainly. Um, a couple of examples that I could point to right now is a company called Uvision 360. Um, they are pioneering single use endoscopy for um, hysteroscopy for the women's healthcare market. And they actually take our light engine, if you will, and they embed it into their scope rather than have a separate light guide or a separate clip on light source. This is completely embedded into the scope. So it's as simple as tearing open the package, sterile package. The patient sees a sterile device each and every time. And um, the risk of spreading 
virulent type uh, antibiotic resistant diseases is essentially eliminated. Um, so th that is one example. Another example is a company called Oraview, and they have developed an endoscope for endodontists to look at uh, the uh, root surface of your teeth from behind the gum. The scope itself is a half a millimeter in diameter and our high output lighting allows them to be able to get sufficient imagery in such a small diameter scope. Yeah. So that's something that's never been, been uh, available to, uh, to endodontists, correct? Right, this is a new, new concept that uh, Oraview is launching right now. Yeah. Now, and you, then you, there you, are other applications of transillumination in dentistry. Um, our light sources are used to transilluminate teeth so that they can see uh, essentially through the tooth um, while they're performing such procedures as root canals and, and that type of thing. Um, we just launched a new product with a Japanese customer for transilluminating the position of a nasogastric feeding tube so that you can assure that the feeding tube is in the stomach and hasn't transited the, uh, in, into the lungs. And uh, this is, you know, a problem that happens from time to time. And this, this uh, company was looking for a solution to that. And that product is about to be launched in April and will uh, be distributed worldwide by B. Brown. So we're very excited about that one. That's a big one for us. Now, did I hear you correctly that sometimes feeding tubes get misdirected into the lungs and you start feeding stuff? I mean, that's, that, would be, that could be fatal, couldn't it? It can be, it is, and it is in some instances. Um, you know, a, a lot of these types of procedures that are done essentially blind rely on technique. Um, and uh, look, you know, we're not doctors here. We do what the doctors ask us to do. Yeah. So in some instances, you know, a doctor will chuckle and say, look, I've been putting nasal uh, feeding tubes in for 30 years. I've never had a problem. That's true. Um, but in, in medicine today, visualization and imagery and positioning is something that is becoming more and more prevalent. And by developing this transillumination process, we are actually evaluating uh, cardiac applications now. Um, uh, applications for dilating esophagus, dilating urethra, and all that it, we provide amazingly is a very bright red light at the tip that transilluminates through the body, but yet it's critical information. It almost replicates having a, a fluoroscopic image. Yeah, I was gonna. I was gonna say that sounds very much. I remember those machines they used to have in the shoe stores where you could stand. You know, <laughs> I'm dating myself now, but in the right. '50s they had those machines where you could look at your at your foot and see if if, if the shoe was if your foot was fitting right in the shoe. You remember those? Yeah, yeah indeed. And uh, I am old enough to remember those. Painfully. <laughs> uh, now, Tom, uh, you're. Um, uh, how, how big is your company? How many employees do you have? So right now here uh, in Beverly, we're only six employees here. Okay. Um, but we utilize contract manufacturers. Um, okay. in, we have a contract manufacturer in Newburyport, another one in Reading, and another one out in Dudley. All of our contract manufacturers are here in Massachusetts. They have specialties that are specific to our needs. And so what we decided to do when we founded this company was rather than build an infrastructure that already exists elsewhere, is to take advantage of the fact that there's reserve capacity in companies here in the Commonwealth that need the business and have these skills that we don't need to duplicate. So here we are design, engineering, marketing, and selling portion of, if you will, a larger entity. Right. So you leverage their, their capacity and their, 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 uh, their skills uh, to, to manufacture to your specs. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's now, um, do you, uh, uh, where are your markets? Are your markets, you mentioned Japanese markets. So you, you must market this 
overseas. How, how do you actually market and distribute the product? Do you do it all yourself or do you have distributors or other kinds of entities that do that for you? Right. We, we go through third party distribution in some instances. In the case of our light sources, we uh, have distributors in each market vertical. One of the things that's interesting about the medical markets is each segment it creates its own vertical, such as ENT, such as urology, such as bronchoscopy, G gastroenterology, and those different market verticals. So what we've done is we've seeked uh, distributors in those um, market verticals, and that's how we distribute. And we build their opportunity. We don't compete with our distributors by selling direct or anything like that. We, we help them build their businesses, which in turn builds our business. Now, the downside of that is, is that we're at the bottom of the food chain, <laughs> uh, being the OEM manufacturer or manufacturing for distributing, but it's okay because we didn't have to build this huge uh, infrastructure and this huge overhead that goes along with that. So we actually have very good partnering relationships in the United States, Canada, uh, Europe, and now we've opened up Japan. Now you mentioned some uh, that you had developed some innovative concepts around lensing and so forth. Now, are, are your are your devices uh, patented? Do you have uh, a patents on, on your on your products? Yes, I'm glad you brought that up. Thank you. Um, so when we looked at how to get the most out of these LEDs, uh, we looked at two things. One is how to efficiently collect the light from the LED. And we developed a lensing system. It's an elliptical um, lens system that captures the light from the LED emitter. And then what we do is we shape that light and we match the exit of the light with the entrance of the fiber that it's going into. What happens now is we have collection efficiency, we have distribution on, on the opposite side. So for us, we find it um, very important to have that real secret sauce. And yes, some patents have issued, some patents are pending. We have patents on the lenses themselves, as well as the uh, optic devices that they go into. Um, and right now we have a total of, I'm going to say nine issued patents and another seven or eight that are in process. Are you, what, what is your background, Tom? Are, are you a local boy here from the North Shore or? Well, uh, <laughs> I moved here in 1978 from Connecticut. Um, I was actually born in Key West, Florida, but my old man was in the Navy and we ended up in New London. So I grew up in New London, Connecticut. Um, and uh, I actually worked at General Dynamics in New London and the joke about me is that I made that natural transition from nuclear submarines to medical devices. <laughs> <laughs> I moved here to go to work for a company in Burlington and stayed there for about four years and left uh, and started my own company, my first company in 1982. Yeah. And um, I've never looked back. So is, is, did you start Acera in 1982 or? or no, I started Acera in 2015. Okay. Um, before Acera, I um, bought a company called Applied Fiber Optics that was located out in Sturbridge. It was actually a company on the edge. I did a workout and turnaround with that company, rebranded it, renamed it. It's now called Optum Incorporated. And it was an endoscopy company. Um, and I ran that company for 15 years, but what I discovered was that trying to compete in that arena with the large companies like Olympus and Stryker and, and Boston Scientific and all these big guns out there was ne next to impossible. I mean, we did okay, but it just, the growth opportunity just wasn't there. So I just said, rather than compete with these guys, let's enlist them. And where I saw an opportunity was in the lighting side. If you're a large company and you're in the uh, medical imaging business, you don't want to spend your engineer's time trying to figure out how to deliver light from a light bulb. What you want to be able to do is just plug a module in and that's a given. 
And you really want to spend your time trying to improve imagery and try to improve the delivery of that imagery. And so that's what's worked for us on the OEM side. I'd like to tell you more of the companies that we are working with, but I have confidentiality agreements with most of the larger companies for obvious reasons. But okay, well, we'll, imagine we'll, that anyone that is a player in endoscopy, we, we have a part in. Okay. <laughs> now let's, let's um, change direction a, a little bit. Now you have developed a, a product uh, and a, a, a new, I don't know if it's a division of a Sarah, it's called Cap Shields. And this is a product that is intended to prevent the spread of uh, COVID or any other kinds of germs or airborne. Um, and, and it's basically a, a shield uh, that, that hangs off of a baseball hat. T tell us a little bit more about that and how did that come to be? Right, so one of our investors is a gastroenterologist. And one of the things that he complained about was these face shields are very close to your face close proximity to your face, one. Two, they're, you know, they got to be replaced and they cost money to do that. Um, and then he said, isn't there a way to just use a hat as the base for it and then come up with a way to put a, a shield on it? And we thought, you know, that's pretty clever. And we started looking at people who wear baseball caps as part of their business, such as UPS drivers, FedEx drivers, and, and anyone that, um, uses a baseball cap in a normal course. And we thought this would be a very simple product that could very easily provide that facial distance and then give them uh, that little bit of extra protection. So we launched the product in, I think it was May, and it's been unbelievable. I, I, I can't tell you. Um, we are on Amazon as well as we have our own um, Shopify uh, account. But um, it's also expanded outward in factories. They wear these uh, bump caps. They're not really hard hats, but they're called bump caps and they're used in a lot of factory settings. So we came out with a line that fits on bump caps as well. And there's an example of people that can't socially distance because of the nature of their work. And they wanna have that extra barrier. Putting up barriers between workstations is not practical. So how best can you do it? So that was one of the examples. Um, we have, we recently got um, a contract with a school bus company. They wanna put all their drivers in cap shields because the putting up a plexi panel is first of all, something they have to keep clean, which is a, just inconvenient, but also it separates the driver from the student. And if they need the students, the student needs the driver's attention in a hurry, they don't want that barrier there. Barrier there so yeah. the cap shield serves that purpose. Yeah. We didn't really have any idea where this was going to go, actually, but it's it's really doing very well. Yeah. So so the the difference because I mean I'm sure that this is an it's it's quite simple really it, it's it's not patentable is it what you did? No, we don't think it's patentable. <laughs> we have attempted to patent it. There are so many different versions of yeah shields, cap shields, and whatnot. Yeah. We have yeah, a clip. It's a simple glide-on clip, though. We think is better than what I've seen in the marketplace. Yeah, because I mean, the, the concept is really quite, quite you know, established. You, you, anytime you see these videos of uh, of nurses or other practitioners in hospitals, most of them have that kind of a that right. kind of a shield on, and it's right. and and anytime there's a spray coming one way or the other, it right. it, it protects. Uh, now, um, uh, how I, I know that one can buy one of these on your website. I went on your website. I didn't buy one, but I, I checked it out. Uh, and uh, they cost $12.95. But I'm sure now, are you, are you trying to get other kind of distribution again uh, to sell these rather than selling one-offs uh, on your website? What, what are you doing to sell uh, quantities of these? Well, we would certainly like to develop distribution. Unfortunately, for a product that sells at that low a cost point, there's not a lot of room in there for people to make money. So make money, when we yeah. look at this, I mean, we're being distributed through um, some industrial supply houses out in the Midwest and so on and so forth. But, you know, you're, you're, you're really talking about counting quarters, you know, I mean, not in a literal sense, but uh, there's just so little room in there. 
for people to want to distribute this type of product. So we find that the, the best thing is just to sell them direct online. We offer discounts for quantities. Um, and when people call and tell us that they have a larger quantity need, we work with them on a one-to-one -one basis. Yeah. Um, we are launching, and it's in clinical trials now, a variant of this. Um, you've read about people wanting to put filtration systems and whatnot on face masks that completely enclose you. Uh, and we don't like that approach. There's a lot of problems that relate to it. One is the confining feeling. The other is how much fan and battery uh, demand there is because of the filter and the like. And we said, look, the problem is being solved in a different way. We don't want to filter out particles. We just don't want the air to be full of bacteria and full of viruses. So we've developed a UV um, plenum that has a, a frontal piece to it where the air comes through, passes through the ultraviolet light, and you get a waterfall of fresh air that um, makes wearing a mask or somehow protecting yourself much more comfortable. Um, so we have several of these in clinical trials right now in three different hospitals. Um, and I expect that that product is gonna launch within the next 90 days or so. We think that is gonna have a much more long-term lasting uh, value because post COVID there's still all kinds of bugs running around out there in the air. And in particularly, if you're in a clinical setting, you're going to want to protect yourself from those bugs. And we think that this has got the best approach. Now we filed a patent disclosure on this concept, which is why I'm speaking to you about it freely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now you would have to have some sort of a power source, like a battery, a replaceable battery inside a there. Replaceable to... battery. Yep. That's right. Yep. Yeah. And so these would these this would be the the ultra deluxe version of the of the cap shield, I, I guess. In a manner of speaking, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're, now, um, they're really designed for a clinical type setting for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, and uh, but your your um, uh, people would still wear masks. Uh, would they still wear wear masks while with with wearing the shield, or could they do it both ways? Uh, you know, that's a that's really good that you pointed that out. Um, in the initial launch, we're going to recommend that people continue to wear masks because it's a proven entity. And what this provides you with is a more comfortable way to deal with wearing a mask. What we have to prove is whether or not the, the uh, user will overbreathe the airflow that we have and take air in from the sides or behind. So we're not quite sure yet yeah. how that is going to work in a, in a setting where people are working and moving and and all of that. So we need to make sure that we don't make claims that we can't prove. Yeah. It's a, yeah. a very slow process, actually. Yeah. It, it's, it's like solving the negative pressure problem of like clean rooms. Is that exactly sort of on right. A, that on, is a, exactly on, a, on a small, le on a small level. Yeah. Right. So picture, if you will, you have your own personal positive pressure room. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. But I got to prove that we can't, you can't overbreathe it. And that's yeah. not done yeah. yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Now uh, we just have a little bit of time left, Tom. I want to, um, uh, for people that are viewers who may have questions, is there a, is there an email or someplace that they can go to get questions answered? Do you want to tell us what that is? And we, we will put that up on the screen here uh, as well. Sure. Uh, info at acerallc.com gets you to the right place. Um, A, okay. A-C-E-R-A-L-L-C without any, any. That's right. Right. Dot com. Okay. okay. Dot com. And now you also have um, two websites, uh, one for Acera, which is acerallc.com, mm -hmm. www. Okay. A-C-E-R-A-L-L-C.com. And another one for www.capshields.com as well, correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. Okay. Very good. Well, um, you know, there. I guess the, the, even during COVID times and during these uh, times of heightened tension and, and what have you and nervousness, uh, there's there's uh, light at the end of the tunnel and 
and there's uh, there's some good things to be said. So um, we're just about out of time, uh, Tom, and I want to thank you for for being our guest today. Well, I would like to thank you as well. Well, and you know, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, for people like us, we always look for ways to let the world know what we are doing and how important what we are doing is to us and to the, the recipients of what we do. So we're grateful for the opportunity to spread the word about our company. Well, keep up the good work, my friend. Thank you. And okay. it's nice to speak with you. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to remind our viewers that you have been watching North Shore Journal. I'm your host, Walt Kosmowski, and we'll see you next time.